Welcome to the show, folks. This is Wrestling Changed My Life. Here we go. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I, I knew what my goals were going into high school, and, and it never changed. I always wanted to be a state champ. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the, the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time I spent wrestling, if it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. This is your host, Ryan Warner. My guest today is Donnie Pritzloff, a true New Jersey legend, folks. He was a two-time national champ for Wisconsin before earning a bronze medal at the 2006 World Championships. He'd go on to coach at Wisco. He'd coach at Big Blue, Michigan for a while. And now he's the associate head coach at Rutgers, building one of the top programs in the country along with Scott Goodale, who's also been a guest on the show. I really enjoyed hearing from Donnie. You know, for years I've heard about how intense this guy is and how hard he works, but he was also just a super cool guy, and I think you'll enjoy this episode. Fan of the Week goes to Rod Hicks. Rod representing Arizona, thank you for tuning in and for supporting the show, sir. This episode is brought to you by a giveaway we're doing on the podcast. I have a pair of Kyle Snyder's. They're a Rudis pair, obviously. Rudis Kyle Snyder's that I'm giving away. If you want to be entered in the raffle, text RUDIS, R-U-D-I-S, to 555-888. I'm doing the drawing tomorrow night. So today's Monday, July 20th. I'm doing the drawing on Tuesday, July 21st. Text RUDIS to 555-888, and you'll be automatically entered into the raffle to win the shoes. And folks, if you want to keep up to date with the show, you can follow us on Instagram, Wrestling Changed My Life. On Twitter, it's my name, Ryan, underscore N, underscore Warner. And then WrestlingChangeMyLife.com for apparel and past episodes. That's it, folks. Let's give it up for the great Donnie Pritzloff. Peace! Donnie Pritzloff, the pride of New Jersey. How you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Doing great. It's great to be on. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We were just talking about your early days training at the edge and you know, Coach Monaco having a big impact on your cousin. But let's just start there, man. Wrestling was a family affair with you. What do you remember from the early days learning from uh, learning from your cousins, Glenn? And is it OD or is it odd? His- Ode. Ode, okay. Yeah, we call them OD, but it, it's just Ode. So ODE, yeah. So how, how much older were those guys when you were growing up? <clears throat> when I was Ode, – Ode was quite a bit older. Than, he was about eight years older than me, and then Glenn was a senior when I was a freshman, so he was roughly four years older than me. So – and and Ode, Ode and Glenn, they got into judo. They, they started uh, training judo at, at a young age, and then as they got older, they uh, they kind of transitioned into wrestling because you know judo is is great for you know when you're younger and you're traveling all over the country and all that. But there's really no there's no high school judo or anything like that. So they they trans transitioned into wrestling, which kind of was kind of seamless. And then Ode was the oldest, so he kind of missed out on being trained by Ernie where Glenn and I both, you know, we got involved in the edge as, you know, young, young kids. And, and then, you know, basically Ernie's a master at in molding young kids into <laughs> learning technique and loving the sport. And, and, um, you know, so Glenn and I really, you know, we started in the Belleville uh, edge. And for me, that was, that was like, three miles from where I grew up. So it was super close. And then, but Glenn was, he made a big commitment. He came up from Lincroft and 
and a lot of kids throughout the state were doing that. They, they would drive just to, to get in that room and, and learn and, and be around the, the best coaching and the, and the best partners that were available for in the, in the entire state. What is his background, Coach Monaco? He, he wrestled in, in college. He went to a small school in Pennsylvania. And then you know, he wasn't a great wrestler or anything as a competitor. And then his brothers, his younger brothers, uh, two of them wrestled at Montclair State, and his his other brother went to uh, Columbia. Mm-hmm. And but, but Ernie's background was his father was a uh, huge into gymnastics. He loved gymnastics, and that was like the basis of of everything they did for all their athletics. And that kind of his dad was like a a, a master at at uh, teaching and and. And you see how that trickled down to, to the brothers. And, you know, Ernie kind of – he took the lead in, in being the lead coach in, in, even in his brothers, you know, as they were at Montclair State. And, you know, John and, uh, and Carl were both – at that time when you were a D3 national champ, you could wrestle in the Division I mm-hmm. NCAA. And you know, John and Carl were both uh, All-Americans in uh, Division I as well. Uh, and, and Carl was in the NCAA finals. He took third and second. Wow. He lost to uh, Tim Krieger in the finals from Iowa State. So Ernie, Ernie basically, you know, he was a big part of coaching them while they were, you know, going through college. And, and then, that, then the, the club kind of developed from that. Like he, he would, guys were coming in and, and training with, with Carl and, and John and a lot of other guys that went to Montclair State. And that kind of just – turned into this, you know, where Ernie thought, like, oh, I can, we, we can make something out of this. You know, and it kind of all sprouted from that. And so was it a standalone facility when you were going? It was in the upstairs of a, I think it was like a machine, like a machine shop on the, on the ground level. Okay. And, and then you'd, you'd walk up these stairs, and then it was like very low ceilings, and it wasn't anything special. You know? <laughs> Uh, the clubs, the clubs that are that they have now, or even the new edge now, you know, and the edge in Hoboken, it's it was very different. It was a, basically a rented space that was near where you know Ernie was living, and and uh, just I don't know, someone whoever whoever rented the place to him took a chance on him and figured <laughs> they, he'd, he'd pay up somehow. And then you know, they, I don't know if they realized that there were just going to be kids from all over the state getting dropped off by their parents and increase the traffic in the area, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy well, because uh, a standalone wrestling facility, even for a college back then, was unheard of. You know, so to have a dedicated place to go is pretty cool. Yeah, no, it was it was awesome. You know, you it, it was, you know, I, you you I re, I always remember like it, on that on that main street right there, and then you walk up that that stairway, and then you're in, into a wrestling room. You know, and and it was like a dream for a, a kid that loved wrestling. You know, you see basketball courts all over town, and tennis courts and baseball fields and and those are readily available for kids that they want to you know play around and get better at what they what they love to do but there really wasn't besides during your wrestling season where the rec had you know their their, their wrestling room that was you know makeshift mm-hmm. um this was like the first place that was like this is actually like our club we can go here and we could we could have a good time learning and getting better and so did you you and your cousin work out Outside of that, like, did you guys have your own wrestling room as well growing up? No, nah, no, nah, that was at the edge. Yeah, we worked out at the edge, and then you know that we, I was involved in my my rec program in my hometown, and and Glenn, I think they had, I think when Glenn got really serious, he was in like junior high. They, they had like a junior high program where they would have dual meets and things like that, and then, and then the New Jersey wrestling is like pretty, it's pretty, it's very intense now, and even yeah. back then it was pretty intense where. You know, they, they would stake qualifiers and all this kind of stuff where it kind of – the rec wrestling kind of mimicked what you were going to expect when you got to high school. So the middle school environment super competitive in New Jersey, the state tournament and all that. Yeah, yeah. It was – for years it was at Union High School, and it was like the – when you, up until you were in eighth grade, and it was like a, a huge deal to even just qualify and then to be a, a kid state champ was like a huge deal around the whole, the whole state. I couldn't find any New Jersey middle school results, man. How'd you do back in the day, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade? I did good. You know, our our my program wasn't wasn't like Glenn's, where it was like in, like a league. 
where you would have like dual meets against other middle school places. But, you know, we, we would do the same thing. We had like rec matches where my dad was heavily involved in the rec and then they would just match you up against different kids from the, the, the local towns. And it was mostly like a scrimmage basically. Mm-hmm. And then you do that and then you do your state qualifiers to qualify for states. And I ne- I was never a, a kid state champ from really? the time I, at, from the time I was in, I think I started when I was in like second grade trying to you know go into union and everything. And I think the, the best I did was third, you know, going all the way through. And I, you know, I, I always wanted to be a state champ. I would, but I just like I, uh, up until eighth grade, I think I took third place in the state, and then you know, but it drove me. You know, it was a, it was probably a good thing for me because you see these kids that are like five, six time kids state champs. They get to high school and they're like, I don't know if they're afraid to lose or whatever. They they have like this thing that they're protecting. Mm-hmm. But for me, it was never like that. I was just like always just trying to get better, trying to get better, and you know, and I think it it probably you know fueled me for a better high school career. So were you doing all the, the crazy stuff running all summer, two a days at, in, in middle school or, or when did that start for you? You know, I, I, I played all sport. I, up until eighth grade, I played basketball. I, I'd wrestle in a, uh, in a tournament. And then that night I'd have a, a rec, you know, a city rec uh, basketball game. So <laughs> I, everything I played football, baseball, I, I played every sport, whatever the season was, that's what I was really into. And that's, all my friends were like that too growing up. So, you know, we, we did everything, baseball, football, basketball, we wrestled. And, and then, and then it, once I got to high school and I realized, you know, this is probably, I'm, I'm probably going to have the, the most success at the next level mm-hmm. in, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be a football player, you know, and then I liked baseball, but I, you know, I, I, I felt like my best chance to, to be successful in college and, and, you know, get to a good school would be, you know, to wrestle. So my, after my sophomore year, that's when I really started, like, totally focusing on just wrestling alone. And do you think you could still do that now as a kid, have that kind of diversity in sport, or does it require an earlier commitment? I, th- I think you should be doing that now. I think it makes you a better athlete. I think, uh, you know, and, and everybody has different philosophies, and I'm not here to tell anybody what they should or shouldn't be doing, but – I do. I, I think there's a lot of value in, like for me, playing football, playing playing baseball. You know, learning how to play basketball. My dad was a basketball player. He grew up in Jersey City, and, and he wanted me to be a basketball player. You know, so that's that's what we did. We we uh, we played basketball when it was when we were in the backyard. We played baseball and wiffle ball and all these kind of things. And I think I developed a lot of athleticism from those different sports. I think sometimes kids really. They just lock in and focus on on wrestling at a very young age, and they're missing out on some of these other, you know, even just muscle groups that you that mm-hmm. you kind of recruit into your whole your whole body structure because you know you've only focused on one thing for your whole life. Now, a lot of these kids end up being e- extremely successful, you know, because they they learn so much at a young age and they do so well, you know. But you know, for me. I felt like it was a it was a great mix of having all these other sports involved in my life because and I just I, I felt like I was a better athlete. Mm-hmm. And you know it's funny because you mentioned earlier protecting things and feeling like you have something to protect if you do really well in middle school. And so you didn't feel like you were protecting anything when you got to high school. You were just wide open. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I knew I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I, I knew what my goals were going into high school and it never changed. I always wanted to be a state champ. I always wanted to be a state champ. That was like my main goal. And going into my freshman year was the same thing. I want to be a state champ. And people would probably think I was crazy for saying that because you didn't even win it when you were in the kids' states. You know, how, how, how are you going to beat these guys that are seniors in high school? So, but for me, I, I never, I wasn't worried about what I had to, you know, oh, I won last year. Now maybe I'll avoid this guy or go a different weight or whatever, you know, whatever goes through these guys minds when they're when they are very successful at a young age so for me it wasn't was never like that and did you have a chance to go watch glenn win a couple of his state titles when you were a kid oh yeah Yeah, that had to be massive right oh yeah when he when he won as a sophomore you know i was i was with him his freshman year when he didn't win and then uh that was the last time it was in jadwin gym at princeton and i remember him and i 
were si- it was crazy back then. It was, you know, it was it wasn't like I had a ticket to get down. Before. Him and I were sitting down Matt's side, and um, Pat Lynch was wrestling Damian Covington in the finals. And it was a huge, huge match in New Jersey. I think uh, Covington. I don't know if he moved down or whatever, but they they were they were like the two premier guys, and uh, it was a it was a great match. And and you know, Pat Lynch ended up I think wrestling at Arizona State. And Covington went to, I think he played football in college at NC State. But I just remember sitting there, and Glenn was so disappointed that he didn't win. And, and then the next year, the high school states were in Atlantic City. It was going to be the first year down in Atlantic City. And then he won that year, and I was there to see him win. And that's when, you know, it felt like, you know, wow, you know, this is, this is something that I want to experience myself. You know, this is great watching him do it, but mm-hmm. I, want to, I want to go through this myself. Well, especially knowing someone who's done something that you want to do, it gives you a different kind of confidence when trying to accomplish it yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I knew I could see what his roadmap was. You know, I, I, could, I could see, you know, the different things that, that he did. And I, and I knew it was possible because we were in the same club. We were doing the same thing. We were being taught by the, the same guy. So I had a ton of confidence knowing that I'm in great hands. You know, I, Ernie knows – knows what to do. He knows what the strategy is to get to the next spot and to, to, to get that title, you know? So that was, that, that just made it so much easier to, to buy into to what he was saying. And was Damian Hahn going through it at the same time you were? He was, uh, my senior year, he was a freshman. Okay, man. Jersey had some products back then between you oh, and him. I mean, that's cr- crazy. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, Damian that year, Damian lost in the finals to Sean Scannell, who ended up going to Ryder. He wrestled at Ryder. He's like a seven, an 84 pound or something like that. And it was a, it was a great match. I think he, I think Damian lost like two to one or something, but mm-hmm. he was, trying, he was going to try to be the first four time. You know, there were several guys that were trying to be the first four timer at that, at that time in, in New Jersey. And I mean, he was probably as close as anybody, you know, losing in such a tight match. That might have been his only loss he ever had his whole college career, his whole high school career. I think it was actually, now that you say that. And, like, as a big guy, as a freshman, to be that, you know, that close to, freaking mm-hmm. crazy. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. And so you, we talked about before we got on the air, uh, Sean Bormet, you know, big-time Illinois guy, big figure in the Chicago area. He started the overtime school wrestling in 2001, and it grew into – you know, national prominence, but he, you know, he swears by the fact that when he was recruiting you, he saw the edge and was like, man, this, this could be cool in Chicago. What do you remember about that recruiting trip where Bormet came out there? And was that the nail in the coffin for Wisconsin? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I think once my mom met Sean, you know, and I was at the, I was at the NCAAs with Glenn again in, in 90, it 94 is in North Carolina. That was mm-hmm. Sean's senior year. He wrestled Pat Smith in the finals. And I remember we were like going through our brackets and picking different guys, like who we thought were going to win, you know, whatever. And uh, I was like, I, I want Bormet, you know, and I was younger than Sean. I was younger than uh, Glenn, at the, you know, obviously. And yeah. Glenn was like, not going to win. He can't, he's, he, dude, this guy's going for his fourth title. He's definitely going to win. You know, you, don't pick him. <laughs> you're going to lose. You know, <laughs> I like this guy. I've been watching him. You know? So I always knew Sean and, I, and the Steiners at the time. I loved them. So they were at Wisconsin. But when Sean when Sean came out to to meet my mom, that was a that was a big turning point in everything because she she didn't, really didn't want me to go far, but I knew that I had to put myself in the best environment with, with the best training partners if I was going to uh, you know be successful at the college level. So when she met Sean, she's like, okay, he's from Chicago, he's similar to us, you know, he he understands it. He's a, he's a kind of like a city guy. He's not. You know, mm-hmm. and she just felt like more at ease, you know, like she could, she could relate really well to him, you know, so. Uh, <laughs> As opposed to what, like some like crazy Iowa maniac coming out there or what? <laughs> yeah, something like that. So I think that <laughs> <laughs> you said it, you said it for me. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, um, so that was, that was a, that was a big piece of it. And then, you know, uh, then, then, you know, we drove down, down to Kenilworth and, and they, they got to watch me work out and everything. And. And uh, I, re- I remember the workout that night. Griff Powell was from Suffern, New York. Mm-hmm. And he ended up at Illinois. He ended up being an All-American Illinois. And him and I trained together all the time at the edge. You know, we just said we had such a great environment there. We had great coaching. And then there was really good partners that were, that were always around, you know. So um, Sean watched me work out that day. 
that it was at night and um I, I didn't feel like I had my best work. I think I was always very critical with myself anyway. I was like always like if I let up one takedown I'd have I would be like so that would, that would <laughs> about you know or if the guy got to my legs one time i'd be like freaking out you know so um you were that maniacal about it though i was i didn't i didn't like to come out of position i didn't like to i just you know especially having sean there watching me you know i wanted to make sure i really was you know put given given the giving them a, a good impression of, of how i competed and how i wrestled and i remember him like talking to me afterwards and and i just felt like i was like this is, this is a guy that i could really lean on and trust you know and and that was probably that was probably the turning point for me. And then when you when you went to Wisconsin, was he there for your entire career? No, he was there my my freshman and sophomore year. And then and then that was so that was after after my sophomore year. Then he went to Michigan. He, went, he went to he coached at Michigan for I think just one year. I think he stayed at Michigan for one year. And then he started overtime that the following year. In, that in, was after the Sydney Olympics. Yes. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. So you mentioned Griff Powell, and I, I noticed an old Fargo bracket from like 96 or 97. I think you took third or fifth. Griff took third or fifth, and then Heskett had won it. When did the – did you wrestle Heskett there, and is that where the rivalry started? I think it was <coughs> 97 at Fargo. It was 97. I, I, I took fifth that time. Um, they, I, I wrestled Heskett like since, since we were kids, you know, because mm -hmm. Ohio and Jersey being so close, you know, we wrestled so many times. It's great. It was crazy, you know, how, how like we'd always be the same size, you know, even when we were like younger kids, you know. So I wrestled him in the high school national finals, you know, that, that same year in 97. And, and just just throughout like our whole career, and anytime there was like a Northeast regional or any any type of like time that we were that the states were in the same place, you know, it seemed like we always would run into each other. But that year, I was on the same I was on the same side of, of the bracket as Griff. So it was, and it was like a three way. And, and back then they did they you know they did Fargo was different the way it is now. So you mm -hmm. you would uh, I I lost to Griff. I beat uh, Brian Burrows. Who ended up going to Oklahoma State, and Burroughs beat Griff. So then the, the way the points all lined up, you know how they did that back then. Yeah, I do know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Burroughs, Burroughs ended up going in the finals against Heskett. Griff went for third. I can't remember who he wrestled. And I wrestled. Uh, I wrestled for fifth, sixth. Ah, oh, geez, he went to Oklahoma. And then he, he coached at, uh, at Pitt for a while. But, I just but had it pulled up, but yeah. Um, he, he, was an, he was an at national champ, too. Well, it's funny, your connection to New York, you mentioned Griff. And, you know, I'm, I'm most fascinated by your time coaching at Hofstra with Tom Ryan. Uh, we'll get to your career. And you had an incredible college career, one of the best in Wisconsin history. Beat Heskett in the finals twice in OT. But then afterwards, you went to coach at Hofstra. Was that something where... I guess how did that all transpire? I just thought that was a, an interesting little turn in your career. Yeah, I uh, after I, I went four straight years in college, so I never redshirted. So then, mm -hmm. the following year, I finished. I was finishing school and I was continuing to train, and and so I I got my degree, and then I and then I hung around. I hung around uh, Madison for a, another nine months, roughly. Mm -hmm. So it might be like my sixth year there. Um, but I, I, knew, I wanted to coach, you know, I wanted to get my career going and you know, I wanted to, you know, kind of like a, a little, a, a good nudge from my dad too. He's like, you gotta, you know, you gotta start, you know, it's time to start you know, making money and, and figuring out what you're going to do, you know, moving forward. You know, it was different back then. It was a different era. The guys weren't making money through clubs and things like that, where you could just basically be like a professional wrestler, you know, like it is now. So most of, pretty much all the guys, if you didn't live at the training center, you were coaching with a program and, and while you were coaching, you were still training and competing. So, you know, Tom reached out to me, you know, during that, I guess it was like during that spring, Tom Ryan, mm -hmm. I went out there and, you know, I, I met Tom and, and uh, my, my girlfriend at the time, she's my wife now, we, she came out with me and, and we, we really liked it. And, 
and just thought like it was basically like a really good starting spot for for us to you know start start our career and and figure out you know what what was going to happen from there yeah he's uh he's one of my favorite people in wrestling just in terms of his energy and you know like when he was at Hofstra it's fun to walk look back at those records and see well he was building something from you know from scratch really and you know he's a New York guy and so it was a good fit and you're an East Coast guy so um what do you take from your time there that you still apply in your coaching today yeah we uh you know we had to recruit a very specific kind of guy because Hofstra wasn't like probably the the most ideal landing spot for a lot of these these top recruits but we were still getting top tier guys like Mike Mike Pasillo and Charles Griffin and you know, Chris Weidman so we would we were very particular about the kind of guy we'd go after because he was a guy that was was just as good as the top tier guys that were going to all these like major programs at the time but maybe maybe they had you know academically they weren't you know they weren't a great fit for for some of these places mm -hmm. or you know maybe maybe they were we felt that they were really good or or that they had great potential but some of these other big time programs overlooked them you know so so that was kind of uh you know something that that I always think about because you know Tom and Tom was really good at identifying those kind of guys like these this this guy has a huge upside so we need to go after him and it seems like he's a little under the radar because you know, we were, we had to convince guys. We had to convince you, like, why why would you go to Hofstra if you could go to, you know, some of these other major programs, you know? Sure. So, so that was something. And, and you know, and Tom always – and he's still the same way now. It didn't it, – it really didn't matter who we were up against. He always thought we were going to win. <laughs> and, and, that, and that's something that, you know, I've always felt that way. You know, there was never – he never would even really doubt – what was what was going to happen in, in winning and everything, whether it was, you know, selling out that, that the arena we had, or if it was uh, getting this recruit over a big time program, he always thought that there's some type of angle that we could create that we'll, we'll convince this guy or we'll win this match, you know, and that's, you know, and then he'd always, he'd fight to the bitter end until, you know, he got what he wanted, you know, and I think I, I still think that's why he's been so successful at Ohio state. People who are optimistic like that, who really are like at all times, even when, you know, it's easy to be optimistic when you're one of the top teams at Ohio State, but back when he was at Hofstra, no one knew who he was. He was still the same way like that. Yeah, yeah he definitely was. He, he was, you know, and his, his energy now is great, but I would say it's, it was even more intense and more in your face and aggressive back then, you know. So, you know, now he's a, definitely a more – refined and, and toned down Tom Ryan compared <laughs> to us. How funny is it that two of the guys who had a big impact on your early career both had epic matches with Pat Smith in the finals, Bormet and Tom Ryan. I know it's, it's, it's crazy to think, to think that, you know, it's Tom it's, Ryan uh, was winning most of that and not most of the match, but he was winning. And then 30 seconds that Pat hits that low single and took him down. I mean, that was, that that's a big match. I mean, yeah, yeah, that, that was, that was, uh, that was devastating. Tom, you know, he, he, uh, he probably still thinks about that moment. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure he does. I know when you get, when you get beat like that, you get burned and, he, and you lose out on a, on a goal that you've had your, your entire life. I think that's something that, that stays with you. And I think, but I think Tom's used that in a, in a positive way to inspire his coaching and inspire his athletes. For sure. I mean, and you, you think you talk about it, like you get second as a junior, you think you're going to go back as a senior, but it's never guaranteed, you know? Um, and so jumping to your career, your junior year, you win a tight one in the semis in overtime and going into the finals, you had Heskett. Had you beaten Heskett at college at that point? Yeah, I beat him uh, earlier that year in a, in a dual meet in, in Ames, Iowa. Got it. So you went out there. I mean, you were at Wisconsin, so it wasn't that far. Okay. And so what, I mean, you're known as someone who's just like a crazy workhorse, you know, the, the competitor's competitor. Someone like you before a big match like that, what's your self-talk like? Is it starting to ramp up or are you keeping yourself calm? When I, when I was a competitor, I, I would ramp myself up. I was getting out. I, I was you know, reminding myself of all the work I put in, reminding myself of who I trained with and how prepared I was. And then anytime any, any type of doubt would creep into my mind, I, I reinforced the fact that, no, nah, there's, there's no way, you know, 
because you, you know as you're taking the mat you, you crazy things start going through your mind you know and especially in a big moment like that so you could you could start thinking like you know you know what if this happens what if, and then you, you have to be a master of that to be able to flip it well what if that doesn't happen what if i do that to him you know so you know that's that's what i was i i, I kind of just started developing this this uh way of of talking myself off the ledge so to speak where i i would you know bring myself back to to reality like it's just a wrestling match and and you know you've prepared for this you're ready for this you've done everything right you've done all these things and, and kind of listing off like the different things i did and and uh reminding your reminding myself and reminding yourself like what you know what's you know what what you're capable of you know and i think that's that's probably the, the biggest thing that i remember of in those big moments of what i was saying to myself going out there why does the mind do that why does it always try to talk you out of something brave and heroic right before it's supposed to happen i i, I don't know i think it's just, i think it's uh it's probably human nature because i think a lot of times you know you, you expect you just automatically you go to that negativity you know it's, it seems like your mind is attracted to the to the negative more than the positive you know so because any anything that you could like i could say hey i'm gonna go out there i wrestled heskey my sophomore year and i took i i took a shot early in the match and then we ended up in a scramble he cradled me up and pinned me and, mm. and i i always had that in the back of my mind and i would always i could always like remember before i'd wrestle him again thinking like what if that happened again and then i would have to i'd have to kind of revert back to say no what if i do that to him you know so i was like trying to trying to counter that but you always i think as humans as a human being you you revert back to like a bad moment you, you that that's more in your mind like if you think about it as a as a wrestler you probably know the matches you lost way more than the guys that you have beaten all the matches that you have won all the matches that i won i really remember the ones i've lost mm -hmm. you know why why is that you know it, it's it maybe it, it hurts more or it burns more so then you you're, you revert back to that just like that moment that i'm, I'm talking about with, with Pesky. um so it just seems like it, it's it's more burned into your memory for whatever reason and i think that that you just have that tendency to, to fall back into that trap and so you you had a practice where you would reframe it just like that. I mean, at the end there, you could do it super quick before a match. Yeah, yeah, because because all these things do go through your mind, and some positive, but mo you know, a lot of them are negative. And and you have to be able to counter that. You have to be able to counter that in your head, so you can go out there in the clearest space possible. And you mentioned you would list off the things you had done to kind of reassure yourselves. So if there's a young high school or college wrestler listener now thinking about ways to get an edge. I'm sure there's no secrets to what you're doing, but do you remember some of the crazy things you do to remind yourself that, hey, I belong here? Yeah. I mean, you mean like physically or what yeah, I was Yeah, saying? exactly. Yeah. Any like savage workouts or any things you did that was just like, like, dude, Donnie's doing that? Like, what the hell's wrong with that guy? Yeah, I, I would, I, you know, I would just, I, as simple as, you know, I wouldn't let a day go by where I didn't push myself to the max and then try to, you push it, push the wall back a little further, you know? So I think it's, it's anything. It's, uh, if I did, if I did 10 sprints one day, the next day I was going to do 15 as hard as I could, you know? So it was always just trying to advance my conditioning, my, my technique, all my, you know, training with the toughest partners I could on a daily basis, ha having you know, two guys trading off on me. Um, they're, they're, during dual meets, after dual meets were over, I go, I go right, right away, right upstairs. And I do, I'd start lifting weights and do conditioning when we were home just so, cause I knew, you know, I, I made it through that match and I pushed myself hard in that match. And then I'm going to push myself a little harder just to know that I, I paid the ultimate price to know that you know, there's, there's no way I'm going to get tired. There's, I, or there, there's, I am going to get tired, but I'm going to be able to cope with it. I'm going to be able to handle it. Mm -hmm. You know? So I think anything where you could really challenge yourself. And I took, I took matches as a way for me to advance my training. You know, so I wasn't happy winning three to two or, or four to two, you know, and a lot of my matches, they, they ended up that way against the, the better opponents. But most of my matches, I went out there, I, I'm going to physically exhaust myself. I'm going to take a million shots. I'm going to get all over this guy's legs and I'm going to create as much action as I possibly can, because that's going to be a good test for me so I can evaluate myself moving forward. And so you, man, working out after a dual meet like that, that's, that's pretty crazy. I mean, and you would, 
you know, now people talk about days off and recovery, but back then it was just every day you're going as hard as you could. Yeah. I, you know, looking back, I probably wasn't papered or, or in you know, going through some. <laughs> yeah. In that now, now, you know, people are more knowledgeable and yeah, there's definitely, there's a lot to like being, you know, being prepared and, and kind of toning it down. And as a coach, you have to, you know, you have to do a good job of, of making sure that your guys are healthy and feeling good. But for, for me, I, that's how I, I thrived on, on that, in, that intensity and, and, you know, that, that hard work and that extra, extra hard work. And, and that's basically, I think that was the key to my success was being able to kind of ride that wave of intensity and then, and then carried me all the way through to March, you know, and it, it, there really wasn't any, like, I wasn't thinking like, Oh, maybe I'm tired today or maybe I should do this. It was always, what else could I, what else could I do? You know, I, that, that was, that was just my mindset. Well, you know how days where you wake up and whatever reason you just feel tired or you feel like going back to bed, were you immune to that kind of thing or did you still feel it and just go right through it? Well, no, nah, I mean, there, there's, there's days that you're, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're exhausted and you're tired and you don't, you don't feel like getting up and, and, uh, yeah, do, doing, doing what you need to do to, to, to get better, to improve, you know? And, and, you know, I, I do remember, I, you know, my, my sophomore year after my freshman year, I didn't, I didn't win the NCAAs. And I, I really, you know, I felt like I was in good position. It was a weird year. It was the year that they changed the weight classes in the middle of the year. And then just, um, you know, it was kind of, it was just like a strange year, you know? And, and then my sophomore year, I felt like I was primed. I was going to be, I was ready to, to win. You know, I just, I really felt like that was going to be my year. And I, and I, uh, you know, for whatever reason, I, I, I fell short, you know, Glenn, Glenn actually won the NCAAs that year. It was in Penn state his, mm-hmm. his year. And then, um, you know, but after, after the NCAAs that year, I just, I, you know, there, there was no waking up and, and feeling sorry for myself. Cause I, I would always remember how painful it was. You know, and it was painful watching Glenn win. You know, I was so happy for him, and I. But it was that was terrible for me because I wanted that. You know, we'd won the Big Tens back to back the two weeks prior. Wow. And then I felt like this is going to be the same thing. We're going to both win the NCAs together. You know, and then you know it, it didn't happen. And but I I remember putting on my ceiling in my uh, in my bedroom. Re- remember the feeling. So every morning I woke up, that was the first thing I saw. And I wanted to remind myself of how horrible it felt to, to not win. And, and that was my goal every day. That was, that was my goal to, to get the, to get the job done. So I didn't have this, this horrible feeling, you know, this void. Remember the feeling is what you wrote. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. And then, did you win the junior worlds the summer after your freshman year or your sophomore year? The, the summer after my freshman year. Gotcha. I was looking back on that. It looked like Steve Benavis won a world title as well that year. Yeah. Yeah. I think we won the whole thing. I think our team USA won the whole thing. We had, oh, there's a, there's, that was a really good team. Munoz was on that team. Um, trying to think who else was. TJ Hill was on that team. Mm-hmm. Um, Reggie Wright was on that team. Illinois so, boy. Illinois boy. <laughs> um, he had an epic match with Eric Siebert who won your weight your sophomore year or freshman year in the Illinois State Finals. It's absolute story of, of legend. Um, no, actually, that was Ernest Benyon. I'm sorry. Er- Eric Siebert, Ernest Benyon. But Reggie Wright had a battle with Tony Davis uh, in the yeah. Illinois State Finals. So, um, yeah, those are, some, those are some fun times, man. And you mentioned uh, on the freestyle scene, you know, world, junior world champ, you won a bronze medal in 2006. But I had read that from like 03, 04, 05, you had contemplated retirement. Um, is that true? And if so, what, what went into that and what pulled you back? I just, I, I would say, you know, at, that, that sixth year in, uh, in Wisconsin that I, that I stayed there, I just, I started getting bored. You know, I just, I didn't, I didn't feel like I, I wasn't, like, I don't think I would thrive the way it is nowadays, the way these guys, they, they just focus just on training. You know, I needed that distraction of coaching. I felt mm. like, you know, so in when I was there in Wisconsin, I just felt like it was great training and all this, but I just I, I, did, I didn't really feel like I had, a, 
you know, because when you when you're in college, you're you're going to class, you know, you're going to class, you're you're studying, you're doing this, and you have your roommates and all that. And then, and then once once I graduated, then it was like all I do is train, you know, I train. I did, you know, it just felt like I wasn't, I wasn't. I, there was a there was definitely like something that was missing. So, then so when you I were just to, working out, hanging around, and not working, not coaching, and so that's when your dad's like something's not right here and you, yeah, you felt it yeah. yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So then I remember I would, then I went to, uh, went to Hofstra and, you know, that, and that, that changed. Cause I, you know, I was, I was at a full-time job and everything and I was still training with the guys in the team and all that. And then, um, I, I remember Sean, Sean coming out and visiting me. It was right after we, I got married and he stayed, stayed for like a week and we were, you know, preparing for, for something and we were training and, you know, I was thinking about being done, you know, and he's like, nah, but, you know, you, you, you have, you have a lot of good wrestling ahead of you, you know? And, and, uh, he basically talked me into just you know, sticking it out for, for a little bit longer, you know, and, you know, I ended up being you know, a great decision because I, you know, I had, I got a, a bunch of good years of wrestling under my belt, a ton of experience, a ton of traveling and, learning from from people from all over the world so that was that was great and it's only helped me with my coaching now well and think about training for an event but also talking to your coach at the same time that you're thinking about retiring that had to be a pretty big warning sign for him um and also just kind of looking back it's like man it's good to know that someone as driven and focused as yourself went through something like that like you said and you can relate to your guys with it yeah yeah I th- I, you know i think there, you know, when you're doing something so long, like your entire life, you know, I think there's, there's definitely peaks and valleys. And then sometimes you, know, you, you can make it, make decisions during an emotional time in your life or whatever it might be. And, and, and uh, you know, you, so, you know, no matter how motivated you are, you know, I don't think, or how much drive you have, there's always going to be a day where you, like you, you're saying, you wake up and you're like, oh, I'm just, I don't know if I have it today, you know? So mm-hmm. you, know, you have to find, find the, the strength and the energy to, to pull it out of yourself and whatever you do, you know, if you're right. at, it's going into the city every day to, to work on wall street or everything, dude, there's probably a lot of days you wake up and you're like, I don't know if I have it in me today, but you got to find a way, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get the job done. Well, now you're doing it at Rutgers, your home state. I mean, it's incredible to see the growth of Rutgers and I've had coach Goodale on here and his story is amazing where he was a high school coach and just totally content with life. And he got pulled into Rutgers and, you know, I had read that he was kind of sitting at a, like a kid's soccer game or a kid's soccer practice. And he reached out and called you. What do you remember from your recruiting trip out to Rutgers back in, I think it was 2014 or something like that. I, I remember, I remember, you know, I, I was going to be leaving Sean. I was going to be yeah. leaving Sean really good experience at, uh, at Michigan. And, you know, I talked, I talked to Scott several times before I, I, I came out on the, on the trip, but I, I remember seeing a, seeing a, a place that had a huge upside to it, you know, and I, 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 I saw that there was just, there, there was like a couple things that were missing, you know, maybe a couple really, really good recruits coming in or, you know, just, uh, a little more experience on the staff or whatever it might have been. And I felt like it was a, it was a diamond in the rough, you know, cause New Jersey people love wrestling mm-hmm. growing up in the state and just all the, all the, the, the friendships and the connections that I have to, to New Jersey people, they, they love a winner and they, they want to be involved and they, and you saw it at the big tens this year that the people showed up and they were, they were excited oh for, for great wrestling, you know? So, I, I knew it was going to be, it was going to explode, you know, it was just a matter of time. And I, and, you know, when Scott called me, I was like, you know, I, I, I had to think hard about it because I, you know, Sean and I went to, to Michigan together, you know, and we were, obviously he's doing a great job there, you know, mm-hmm. they, have, they have a great program and we were building that together. And it was, you know, I remember Sean telling me, he's like, it's just starting to get fun. You know, we're just starting to, you know, turn the corner here and you're going to leave. And, and uh, so that was, that was hard, but, I knew I was going to a place where I, I felt like we could re- we could make a huge impact in, in New Jersey and then in, in the Big Ten eventually. Well, and plus Rutgers has a huge fan base. Like people love Rutgers, which I, I was at the Big Tens this year and it was evident that 
people love it out there. When you were like going back to high school in 97, was Rutgers even on the map? Did they recruit you? Were they like selling you as hard as they could to get the homeboy in state? The in state no. boy? No, it was different back then. They they just they they didn't they didn't have uh I don't know if they didn't have the resources or you know, they just it it was uh it, it was totally different than it is now. You know, the the the, the staff didn't have the the vision you know they were they were kind of just a they were a low level program and some good guys from New Jersey went there but it wasn't on my radar at all you know my my main thing was training partners mm -hmm. and they couldn't they, they I, didn't, I couldn't even tell you who 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 were they gonna who were, who was I gonna train with there you know you know so for me you know and at that at that time all the best guys were leaving the state. They're all they're all leaving the state, so it's a little. I'm a little hypocritical now when I talk to these Jersey guys and say, "Hey, stay, stay, stay." But it's a, we have a much better product, you know. And 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 back then it just wasn't like that. I re, I do remember going on a recruiting trip with my best friend to uh, to Rutgers. Didn't the head coach say uh, like, "Hey, if you don't go, if it doesn't work at Wisconsin, we got the same colors." Yeah, he he did. Sachi Sachi, he said that he was recruiting my next door neighbor, Tom McSweeney, and. Um, Tom was like, hey, I don't have a car. Can you get your dad's car and drive us, drive us, uh, drive me down for my visit? <laughs> I'll tell the guidance counselor you get a day off of school. So I was like, yeah, that's, you know, I was a senior at the time. I was like, I'm done with school. I, I, I had enough, you know. So I drove him down there and we got the, the tour of the campus and everything. And, and uh, that's, that's what Sachi said to me at the end. Yeah. That's funny. And now you're there. I mean, when, when Coach uh, Goody was recruiting you on this trip where he flew you out and you're, he's showing you around campus. I heard that he was talking about like the vision of wrestling at the rack. Were you not wrestling at the rack at the time? Yeah. Yeah. We, we weren't, you know, there was a couple duels that were at the rack in, in, you know, the last few years. Yeah. But, but prior to that time, there, there was no, there wasn't like a consistent uh, schedule where we were, you know, always at the rack, you know? So I think it, you know, as, as we got into the big 10 and as our fan base increased, you know, we were still my, my first year there, we were still wrestling at college Ave gym and we wrestled Ohio state there my first year. And it was, it was insane. I mean, at that place, I don't know if you've ever been in there, but that place is small. It's incredibly hot. <laughs> you know, it's like they, they have all the, the, the radiators around like the, the upper walls going around. And once the, when they're on, they're on. You know, there's no there's no turning them off. So we wrestled Ohio State there, and it was it was super hot there. And then we were beating them at halftime. We were like dominating them. I think we we were like beat them like uh, four matches to one, and the, the fans were going crazy. You know, they they're like they, we're gonna win. They're gonna win this duel. They're gonna they're gonna upset upset uh, Ohio State. And after that, that was pretty much the last duel there. I think we wrestled Princeton there, and then it just got to be too much. We had too too many season ticket holders. Our season ticket holders, they the capacity wasn't big enough to even just have them. So for a regular duel, we couldn't even guarantee that you'd get in. So then, you know, the administration, you know, they they recommitted to us and they said we're going to have all the duels over at over at the rack. Let's go, let's go. And now you guys have just one of the top spots for wrestling in the country, you know, top 10 every year in attendance. Sea bass is coming home, man. I got to tell you when he, after he won the big tens and he gave a shout out to Jersey, I didn't even know he was from Jersey before that. My brother and I were like, Holy shit, dude, this place loves him. So it, it's awesome to see him back there. I know it hurts my friends at Northwestern, but Hey, that's part of the game. Um, you got Soriano coming back. What's the, uh, we'll sign off with this one, coach, you know, as you look to the future with Rutgers, you know, what, what excites you about getting up for the job every day? Yeah. I, I love working with the guys. I, I, that's, that's my, my favorite part of it, you know, and I love, uh, you know, we have so much support and we have people that are just there. They, they love Rutgers wrestling. They, they love Rutgers, but they love Rutgers wrestling and they, they show up and, and they, they support our guys. And I think that, making them proud, making our supporters and our, our fan base proud of our, the product that we put out there. That's, that's what drives me. That's, that's the most important thing to me because these, you know, these, these people that, you know, the reason why Sebastian came wasn't because anything that Scott or myself did in particular, it was the, the fans of New Jersey and the brand that we've built, they recruited him to us. 
you know, the, the love that they showed him at the Big Tens, that, that was it. That was the nail in the coffin. And I know his, his dad is, is out here and his mom and his, his family and everything, and he wants to get involved with, with his dad's club probably when he's, when he's done. So that was a big draw as well. But the, the finishing touches were that, that Big Ten tournament. With the way they treated him and, and the, the amount of love they gave him, they, mm-hmm. it was like he was on our team. You know, I felt so I that. Think, yeah. 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 So, you know, that, that was, that's really what got him back here. And that's, you know, that's what, that's what our program is, is built. We built that fan base. We didn't have a great big 10 and, and individually with our team, you know, but our fans were still, they were there because they love wrestling and they, they, they support us unconditionally. So I think, you know, that's, that's the most important uh, thing to me is making sure that those supporters and those people that are loyal to us, that they know that they appreciate the product that we're putting out there. And, and there's been, there's been nights and there's been times where I haven't been super proud of, of the way we competed. And you know, that, that drives me to make sure that, that we put out a, a premier product every time we take the mat. Well, it shows, man. And, you know, it's fun to watch you guys duel anyone. And, you know, I'm just looking forward to the future. We didn't talk about the NJRTC and all the exciting things happened there, but there's a lot going on, man. And we'd love to have you back on. Coach, thank you for your time this morning. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And all great things must come to an end. If you want to hear more from the podcast, text WRESTLE to 555-888. That's WRESTLE to 555-888. You can also find us on Instagram, Wrestling Changed My Life, Twitter, Ryan underscore N underscore Warner, as well as our website, WrestlingChangeMyLife.com. Take care, y'all. Calm. 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 Take care, y'all.